Hello everyone, uh, this is uh, the next video, um, and we're just still talking about adolescence, chapter 12. But here we're going to talk about uh, relationship with parents and peers, sexuality, and then we're going to talk about juvenile delinquency and suicide rather briefly. So I'm going to begin here with relationship with parents and peers. Okay. Now during adolescence, uh, obviously the child or the adolescent uh, starts to depend on the parents less than they used to. And uh, there is a, uh, you start getting closer to friends, teachers, and other outside individuals. Now, um, adolescents obviously still continue to interact with uh, parents, but usually it tends to be mom more than dad. Why does this happen? Well, especially in our culture, um, uh, mom tends to be the problem solver. And so, uh, you know, when you have a boo-boo, you go to mom. When you, uh, so you have a problem, you're frustrated, you want to know where mom is. Mom is the one that helps fix things. And dad, tends to be uh, the, the playmate, the friend. And so when you start making friends outside of the family, well, then you don't depend on dad quite as much. Now, having a good relationship with dad still contributes to uh, psychological well-being. So therefore, it's important for dad to find a way to stay in the mix and to be part of their their child's life, even in adolescence, even when they're still trying to kind of pull away. Now, um, the bickering does increase uh, during, um, excuse me, uh, during adolescence. Uh, there's less things happening between the, the adolescent and the family. It's not always as dramatic as TV shows and movies make it out to be. Uh, but it does happen, and obviously it happens because when you're an adolescent, everything in your body is telling you that you're grown, right? If you go back to whatever some caveman times, that 13-year-old, that 15-year-old was kind of doing their own thing. Their body was telling them, you're grown now, and they were trying to be an adult, uh, and in some cases succeeding. But we don't live in that world anymore. We don't live in a world where, so long as you can, you know, punch your way through something and kill a, you know, a, a deer to eat, then you're an adult. Uh, we live in a world where being an adult is much more complicated and takes a lot of know-how. And so, uh, here is this adolescent who, whose body is telling him, "I am an adult." Whose body is telling her, "I am a grown-up." And everybody in this person's life is telling them, no, you got to learn chemistry now. Um, that's that kind of a dynamic is going to increase frustration. And then here's mom and dad saying, you can't go out with your friends. You have to stay here and babysit or have dinner with the family. And of course, that's going to be very frustrating for the child. But it is important that parents set good boundaries. Also important that... Uh, parents relax control. Um, you can't control every aspect of an adolescent's life. Um, when you do, you're actually creating a worse dynamic and you're kind of pushing the child away. It doesn't mean let the, the adolescent do anything that they want. It means have realistic expectations of what uh, the child can do and can't do. And probably if you're starting this at age 15, you're going to lose this battle. It's going to be create a big problem. You have to start this in middle childhood and late childhood, where you start giving the child freedoms and then take them away when they mess up. Give them freedoms and take them away when they mess up. That way, when they're an adolescent, they're used to that dynamic and they're not going to fight you as much, especially when they know that like what they did was wrong. They're going to accept uh, those uh, those terms. Now, 
Um, I mentioned uh, in the past talking about the authoritative parent, the authoritarian parent, the neglectful parent, um, and the permissive parent. And what we find is that children who come from authoritative homes, that is parents who have good rules, they enforce the rules with consequences, but they're also very good at saying, I love you and you're great and aren't you the best kid? Those kids tend to do better during, um, during adolescence. They show more competent behavior. They're more self-reliant. They do better in school, tend to have better mental health and self-esteem, um, and show the lowest incidence of psychological problems, the lowest incidence of misconduct, and the lowest incidence of drug use. Um, uh, the other of the other um, parental styles, usually the neglectful parent, uh, those children tend to do the worst out of everyone. But it is the authoritative or the children of authoritative parents that tend to do the best. Now, as I mentioned, during adolescence, you do have more friends than young children. Usually, young children have like one or two friends, or maybe they go to pre pre K, they'll have a couple of friends. But those friendships aren't very strong. And as you get older, you might have one or two best friends. But by the time you're entering adolescence, the groups get bigger, and so. You might have developed uh, a few friends uh, that are pretty good and maybe one or two best friends that uh, you kind of do everything with. For adolescents, there is a great deal of um, time spent uh, where what is important in the relationship is, excuse me, acceptance. Um, and the ability to self-disclose. That is, I want to tell my best friend everything about myself. And I expect that because you're my best friend, you're going to accept me because of it. And obviously you're not going to tell anyone else what I've told you. And um, for adolescents, if someone breaks that, it can be very traumatic for them. If someone, you know, if you tell your 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 best friend or your friend something that happened to you and they're like oh that's weird it's just incredibly overwhelming for that uh, teenager whereas once you're an adult uh, there is sort of this understanding like yeah not everybody's gonna agree with me not everybody's gonna understand where I'm coming from and you can just kind of leave it at that so that adolescent is just very traumatic when someone doesn't understand them that they expect to understand them Having a lot of friendships contributes to a positive self-concept and good psychological adjustment. This becomes a problem for boys especially because early in middle school, there's a lot of disclosure. But what starts to happen is that then all of those masculine uh, traits start to kick in and you've internalized a bunch of things. And now it's not okay to cry in front of your friends because you know, they're going to make fun of you or they're going to think you're weird. It's not okay to disclose too much, to tell people how you feel, right? Maybe you're really in love with that girl, but you don't want to say that because your friends are going to think that you're weird or that you're going to, uh, they're going to make fun of you. And so what tends to happen is that boys are desperate for that acceptance and intimacy and self-disclosure, but they really don't have a lot of people to disclose to it. So hopefully maybe they have like one or two best friends that they can do that with. But of course, a lot of boys don't even have that. Um, now, another thing that you're going to find is, uh, especially in middle school and in high school, definitely, that there are cliques that start to develop. So a clique is a small group of friends that hang out together. And uh, it becomes incredibly tight-knit and there's a great feeling of like other people aren't allowed in the clique. And, you know, this is us, we're the group, and that's all that we are. And then there tends to be a larger crowd. And so the larger crowd might be the jocks, and then the clique might be, you know, those five cheerleaders that hang out together, and the four, you know, football players that are always together, and maybe 
uh, I don't know, the uh, the freshman, I don't know, volleyball player. They're totally a clique together. Um, but then they're, they also know that they're all kind of part of this bigger crowd, which is the jocks. And there's, you know, a lot of movement in between the crowd. But between the clique, they tend to be quite close off. Um, usually crowds are identified by specific activity, the jocks, or the, I don't know, the computer crowd, the techie crowd, or the Dungeons and Dragons kids. And those tend to be sort of, you know, slightly bigger crowds, depending on your school, right? Maybe the Dungeons and Dragons kids in your school were just a small clique because there weren't a lot of them. But, you know, in different schools, there might be a, a sort of bigger crowd. Some crowds fall very neatly into adult society. That doesn't mean that they're they're always adult-like, but they tend to do better. Um, they're going to do less drugs often. They're often going to have you know, more adult-like goals and more adult-like behaviors um, and expectation. Because, of course, an important part of the crowd and the clique and just friendships in general is that because we're friends, I have expectations of how you will behave and you follow them for the most part. You tend to want to fit in with your with your group of friends. And so if your group of friends tends to be a crowd or a clique that is very adult-like, the jocks and the cheerleaders, the FBLA kids or the um, you know future farmers of America kids, um, those are more adult-like groups and uh, cliques and crowds, um, then those kids tend to follow very sort of adult-like behavior. Not always, they're still kids. All kids get in trouble, all kids do weird things. And, you know, maybe there's a little clique or a little crowd that um, sort of you know, uses more drugs and then that sort of spreads. Those things happen. But on average, it, they tend to be more adult-like. Whereas some crowds just sort of uh, are more counterculture and they sort of push away from adult ideals. And so you get a lot of uh, maybe um, goths are often sort of fall into this uh, group and you know maybe kids who are more I don't know, I'm gonna go with gangster or uh, there's certain type of uh, behaviors that are like more counterculture and so what tests start to happen is that these are your friends and your friends expect you to behave a certain way and the way they expect you to behave is not like an adult or specifically do things that adults don't want you to do and because you're part of the group, you tend to follow along. And so these kids are more likely to do drugs, more likely to get in trouble, etc. Um, and so which crowd you belong to does kind of affect uh, how well you accept adult, uh, adult life. All right, I'm going to shift here a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, romantic relationships and dating. Now, um, dating often uh, starts out in uh, early and middle adolescence, so in middle school and uh, in, uh, excuse me, early high school. That tends to be where a lot of people, you start seeing a lot of people are finding a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they're talking a lot more about their first kiss uh, and things like that. Um, uh, adolescents start dating or going out uh, usually by the time that they uh, graduate high school, they probably at least dated a couple of times, and a lot of people have had their first boyfriend or girlfriend by that point. Um, now, relationships are obviously more stable in late adolescence. In that middle school uh, dating, and sometimes you're like, yeah, we're dating because I asked Susie, you want to be my girlfriend? And I don't really talk to her, and I don't hang out with her. And we don't really go anywhere after school. Maybe we talk on the phone, and just as easy, Susie might send her friend to tell me that we are broken up. Those things, those relationships are not stable. They're almost like practice relationships. But by the time you get to late adolescence, especially late high school, those tend to be a lot more stable and more committed. Now, dating uh, is important because, first of all, dating is fun, usually. Uh, now, some people kind of go out of their way to make dating not fun, but 
that's usually the purpose of dating is that you're going out places and you're having a good time. Uh, dating also it has its prestige, especially in school. Um, and the longer you've been together, the more kind of prestige that relationship tends to have. But there's a lot of dynamics to that. If you're in middle school and you're one of the first set of kids to be in a relationship, that brings prestige. If you're in high school and you've been together with your boyfriend or girlfriend for whatever, three years, four years, people tend to think that that's important. Or maybe you're dating someone who's really popular and people also find that to have a certain prestige to that. Um, obviously, it gives the experience uh, in learning to relate to people, to relate to future relationships if those relationships don't work out. Um, it just sort of prepares for adult courtship. I kind of already mentioned that uh, the relationship or the uh, influence of your parents sort of gets a little bit weaker as you enter um, adolescence. It tends to be still kind of strong in the beginning, sixth grade, seventh grade, but that starts to weaken. And so you start to care more about your friends in the middle of that, especially eighth, ninth, tenth. 11th grade but hopefully by the 11th grade you've started to rebalance that um, and sort of uh, not that you stop caring about what your friends think or what your teachers think but now you're balancing that off well with what your parents have taught you and your morals and your values and in fact what we find is that parents and peers tend to have complementary influences and most adolescents agree with their parents on things like moral principles and future educational and career goals. And they tend to agree more with their friends on things like music and style and ways of speaking. Uh, and so usually there is a balance there. And that balance is important. Your friends and your peers are the people you're going to go to work with. They're the people that you're going to live the rest of your life with. Um, but your parents are obviously the people that care the most about you, hopefully. And so it's important to sort of care about what their values are because they you've probably just internalized a lot of those. And so as your identity becomes achieved, you, uh, you start to value those more. And you don't think of them as my parents' values. You start to think of them as my values. It just happens that when a psychologist comes around, and asks you what your values are, they tend to match up with what your parents' values are uh, once you are an adult. But of course, not so much when you are in early adolescence or say middle adolescence. All right, um, a little bit more about sexuality here. Um, now, often, one of the things that's gonna to start to happen more, especially as you enter adolescence, is the increase of masturbation. Um, so obviously masturbation is uh, touching your uh, genitals specifically to elicit self-stimulation. Um, and this is for the average teenager, the most common sexual outlet. And this is it's unhealthy. There's a lot, you know, depending on your background, your culture, your religious beliefs, you might feel that this is somewhat unhealthy. And the truth is that most studies show that this can actually be quite healthy unless it becomes addictive. And of course, it can be addictive. Um, if you're doing this to the point where you're not spending time with people, you kind of prefer masturbation to having a relationship, that can become a problem uh, with your relationship, with your functionality in general. And so obviously, uh, Control needs to be uh, thought about, but you know, just masturbation on its own does not necessarily uh, mean that there's something unhealthy going on. In fact, it could be quite healthy, uh, especially for teenagers who we don't want necessarily having sex until you know they're in a more committed relationship. Minimum. Uh, obviously, males masturbate more frequently than females. Why does this happen? Well, for one. Males have way more testosterone than women. Uh, in uh, women, testosterone does make them more sexual. So if you're a woman who has a little bit more testosterone than the average woman, you are more sexual than the average woman. 
but for the most part, uh, women only have about 5% the amount of testosterone that men have. And so the testosterone uh, increases the, the thought or the ideation of sexuality. So men think about sex all the time. And of course, that usually means that men are going to masturbate more. Um, although masturbation tends to be taboo, it's not quite as taboo for men as it is for women. Most people talk about uh, men masturbating at some point. You've probably heard about it in you know, middle school or high school, and it's usually making fun or joking around. But eventually what you figure out is that, yeah, a lot of men masturbate, but women don't have that. Very few people talk about female masturbation, and uh, it's sort of an even greater taboo. So a lot of women sort of struggle uh, to come to terms with sort of that stigma, and, and even though they might find it pleasurable, and it is, um, and there's nothing wrong with it, uh, the constant stigma that seems to be a part of that, that they internalize that, and that makes them feel sort of bad. So women are less likely to masturbate, or perhaps uh, less likely to admit to it. Uh, because of course, how we get this data is that we ask people. And so if you're not very comfortable with that about yourself, you might just lie. And so at the very minimum, women don't admit to it as much as men do. Uh, obviously, um, teens are dating, and uh, the earlier you start dating, the more likely you are to engage in sexual activity during adolescence. And especially when there's no one talking to you about uh, sex and protection, having sex early on means that you're probably not using contraceptives, condoms or other forms of uh, contraceptives, of stopping yourself from getting pregnant. Um, now, uh, there's obviously part of dating is a sexual aspect, and so kissing starts usually comes first, and then there's a lot of petting, which includes kissing and touching. Um, uh, obviously, the probability of having sex rises dramatically as you get older, and it also rises um, when you don't have people telling you their value. Some parents are very good at expressing their values and saying, you know, you should be waiting to have sex, to have sex until you get married. Uh, you should be waiting until you find the right person. You don't want to get pregnant. Um, uh, you should learn to say no, to uh, call me, etc. And when parents express that very well, to their children, their children sort of internalize that as their own values. And so when the situation comes up, those kids are much more likely to put a stop to it. Whereas when parents don't express their values, well then those kids kind of don't know where their parents stand, therefore they don't really know where they stand. And when it comes up, they just kind of go along with what's happening. That's not to say that, you know, you can tell your kid, or something a million times and sometimes the situation the pressure uh the social pressure is just too strong and they kind of uh give in to it that all happens to everyone but when kids don't know what their values are it happens even more uh and it's much more likely to go on all right as i mentioned um there are hormonal changes hormonal changes happening in puberty boys tend to have more testosterone than women and so men are much more likely to sort of be affected by uh, violence, by ideation and sexual ideation. And so uh, boys are more, more likely to try or want to engage in uh, sex. And of course, boys tend to be more likely than women to be violent. Um, I would like to point out that most boys, most men control that well, but it is more increased in boys than girls. Uh, girls have about 5% the testosterone of boys. And so um, their uh, sexual desire um, and their desire for sort of violence or to act aggressively is sort of lowered. Of course, some girls do have more testosterone than other girls, and so they're going to be more sexual, um, and that tends uh, to happen more uh, in women, older women, um, 
is that testosterone level is going to go up. Is what is usually middle-aged women who have sort of that healthier sexual appetite, whereas young girls don't have that quite as much. I always like to point out that uh, one of the things that we know about transgender men, that is, people who were born male or assigned, excuse me, born uh, female or assigned female at birth, but in adolescence are transitioning into men, well, one of the things that starts to happen is they have to take uh, testosterone as a supplement. That is, they go to the doctor, the doctor gives them testosterone to take. And one of the things that transgender boys will say is, wow, I can't stop thinking about sex. It's like I, it's all I think about uh, after I take those testosterone uh, shots. Sometimes the opposite happens. Sometimes men who are just normal, uh, healthy men, they're cisgendered males, but something happens where their testosterone or the ability to, to pro produce testosterone gets damaged. And one of the things that happens is that their sexual desire drops and they don't have quite as much sexual desire. So uh, hormones are incredibly important to the aspect of sexuality. But of course, it's not just uh, hormones. A lot of social factors play a role here, um, depending on who your family is, what their expectations of you are, uh, what their expectations of your self-control are. Um, all of those things play a role. But it would be silly for us to pretend that hormones are not a real thing that are affecting you um, and affecting your sexual behavior. I kind of already mentioned this, but obviously, uh, Parents who are close with their children um, and who express their values to their children tend to have uh, adolescents who initiate sexual uh, activity later in life. Um, and uh, usually when parents are not very close to their children or when parents don't express their value to the children, they are more likely to engage in sex earlier in their teenage life. On the other hand, peer influence often is a push to have sex or other sexual activity. Um, oftentimes, your friends are talking about the, the fact that they've had sex or they're lying to you about it. Many teenagers will tell you that they have, in fact, had sex when, in fact, they haven't. But you don't know that. Uh, especially when you're a teenager too, and uh, that pressure of being like, I'm the last one, I'm the only one who hasn't done this yet, sometimes that feeling uh, pushes people to have sex before they're ready. Um, and of course, uh, your friends and your media, and the media, TV, movies, the internet, often are a source for sex education, and they're not always a good source. Yeah, sometimes you can go to the internet and find great websites that express things that are accurate and scientific or socially responsible. But there's a lot of stuff on the internet and TV and movies that are just lies that are put in there as a joke or that are put in there about a specific group of friends or a specific type of people that they're... Uh, you know, sort of showing that movie or in that TV show. But teenagers will internalize that as, oh, this is what everybody's doing. And so again, it's really important to have good sex education, either coming from the parents uh, or coming from the schools. Um, this uh, leads straight into something that is kind of a brand new thing, which is sexting. Um, it's not something that is invented, right? People have always been sending, you know, pictures of themselves to each other. But this is just like, you know, usually you have to kind of be crazy about it to take a Polaroid or a picture and have it printed and then send it to someone. Uh, uh, and so you were, it wasn't quite as risque in the past. Uh, phone sex was something that people used to do. Uh, but again, now sexting allows you know, for that visual aspect 
But by the way, sexting is when you send text messages, usually with sexual contact pictures uh, and things like that. Uh, people use this in relationships because it's uh, sexually arousing. Um, sometimes it, it uh, increases intimacy, uh, but it can very easily be used to humiliate others. Um, and of course, we see that especially among teenagers, but we see it also with TV stars or people who have professional lives and like, oh, you know, you don't want this picture to get out. That is just a thing that happens. And so it would really be best if you didn't involve yourself in that. But it is, uh, it is something that happens so often nowadays that is, it's just kind of important to talk about it and express the things that can go wrong. Um, now, usually most people are using uh, texting to arrange sexual encounters. In other words, it's someone you don't really know that you've met online and sexting is part of the kind of courtship dance. Um, but of course, you don't know this person. And also, even if you do know them, some people, while you're in a relationship with them, act a certain way. And when you're not in a relationship with them, act in a completely different way. And often, when you break up with someone, there's a lot of hard feelings. And if this person has a folder full of pictures that are risque uh, of you, then you just kind of put you're putting yourself out there uh, and making it more likely that uh, those pictures will leave. Also, I'd like to point out that you know I'm, I'm, gonna kind of, I'm kind of saying you're putting yourself out there. It's always the fault of the person putting the pictures out there. That person is doing the thing that's wrong. But it is also important to remember that not everybody has your best interest at heart. And so sometimes it's just better to not take the chance. Uh, so it's good to sort of remember, don't believe uh, that anything you've sexted is private. Uh, nothing that you put on the internet or that you have sent electronically ever goes away. Sometimes even if the other person deletes it, uh, there is a way to capture it. Um, even if the app says it automatically deletes something, there is a way to capture it. So it is good to just sort of resist that desire to, tap, uh, to sex. Um, another thing that happens is that not everybody wants to see you naked. Uh, and so you should probably ask before you send a picture that the other person doesn't want to see. Just because you find this person sexually attractive doesn't mean that they find you sexually attractive. And even if they do find you sexually attractive, that doesn't always mean that they want you to send them pictures. Um, you should always ask or wait until someone asks you to send the picture uh, because you're really kind of putting yourself out there and you may just be sexually harassing someone without meaning to. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about pregnancy. Um, in the United States, we don't do well with teenage pregnancy. And one of the reasons we don't do well at stopping teenage pregnancy is that we don't talk enough about sex education. And when we do talk about sex education, we often talk about abstinence uh, only. And we say, you know, don't have sex, don't have sex, sex is bad somehow, blah, blah, blah. But that these kids are still teenagers. They still have the great desire to have sex. It is a biological drive that is pushing children or adolescents to have sex. It's kind of like telling someone, you shouldn't eat, don't eat. Well, there's a biological drive that's pushing you to eat. The same way that there's a biological drive pushing uh, uh, teenagers to have sex. And so it's good to express your values to teenagers and tell them to wait. But when you don't give them other options, what happens is they're in a situation and they give in to their sexual desire. And now they don't know about using uh, condoms, about other forms of uh, stopping pregnancies. And so it increases the chances of them having sex, because of uh, them having a, a, a sexual encounter that leads to pregnancy. 
And Americans just have more kids than other uh, advanced societies in Europe, uh, Australia, things like that. The uh, excuse me, the pregnancy, the teenage pregnancy rate is much lower. Um, usually, it's because teenagers are not calculating their uh, their chances of getting pregnant well. Uh, and sometimes adult, it's the adults' fault. Sometimes adults will say uh, condoms um, uh, can't be trusted. And so teenagers go, well, if condoms can't be trusted, then what's the point of using them? If they're not effective, what's the point of using it? And so they don't use it. And of course, condoms are effective, uh, way more effective than uh, the rhythm me method. The rhythm method is when a woman tries to know when she's on a period and have sex when you know when she's not on her period. That is not very effective. Pulling out is not effective. Condoms are definitely way more effective than that. Um, now, with all that being said, it is important to point out that uh, teenage pregnancies have been going down all throughout the generation. And so when you see this graph, this graph starts in the 1990s and it goes all the way down to 2017. And what you're seeing is that there is a constant uh, shift downward uh, in the United States. It's just that compared to other countries, we're still not doing well. I said with to other to, uh, advanced countries or Western uh, countries, we're not doing as well. Um, but we still are doing way better than we were doing in the past. Now, obviously, when a girl uh, gets pregnant too early, uh, this can have complications uh, during pregnancy and labor for a lot of reasons. Maybe the girl isn't done with puberty and her body really isn't ready to have a baby. Uh, another thing is that uh, if, if the girl is too young, she might not have the resources to get, for example, I don't know, uh, neonatal, excuse me, prenatal vitamins so that she can have a healthy baby. Maybe she doesn't have the resources to see a doctor on a regular basis so that her baby can be healthy. So this is all going to affect pregnancy and labor. Uh, therefore, kid, uh, babies of teenage mom tend to be more likely to be premature and of low birth weight. Um, also, having a baby early it makes it more likely that mom will not graduate from high school and it makes it even more likely that she won't get her degree in college. Um, and of course, if you're not in high school, if you don't finish your high school diploma or if you don't go to college and on top of that, you have a child, there is a really high chance that you're going to be lower income. And all of that is going to affect your baby's life and your life. Uh, so therefore, it's important to talk about, to children about, uh, or actually adolescents, about sexuality, have good sex education, uh, talk to teenagers as though they're going to have sex, not tell them to have sex. You always want to express whatever values you think are important about waiting until they're in a committed relationship, until they're married, because of course, you don't want kids to just be having sex uh, with everybody they meet, or to start using sex as a coping mechanism, and just sort of uh, uh, be having way too much sex and putting themselves at risk. Uh, but you know, you want to be realistic, and sort of in the modern time, a lot of people wait to get married until they're in their mid 20s mid 30s sometimes and so uh sometimes people are going to be in a committed relationship way before they get married you say well we want you to be wait until you're in a committed relationship um and of course we want to provide for family planning as well let me talk briefly about sexual orientation uh, so most people are uh heterosexual uh Usually, the average person is going to be heterosexual. The society kind of expects you to be heterosexual. So most people just kind of fall into those grooves. But not everybody is heterosexual. 
Uh, some people are what we would sometimes call homosexual or gay men or lesbians. Uh, those tend to be the, the phrases that mostly accepted uh, by those uh, groups themselves. And so if you're gay, then you are what we call homosexual male, that is a usually a cisgendered male who find other males sexually attractive. If you're a lesbian, you're a homosexual female, that is usually a cisgendered female who finds other women or other females attractive. And in any given group, 2 to 10% of that group tends to be gay or lesbian, tends to be homosexual. Now, some people are what we would call bisexual. And uh, people who are bisexual are really hard to study because they don't always fall neatly into a group. Uh, even for uh, people who are gay or lesbian, there are people who are like, I would write around, you know, adolescents, they say, you know, I'm gay. And if you find them again when they're 60, they go, yeah, I was still gay and I've always been gay or I'm a lesbian. And when you find them when they're 60, they're still a lesbian. Now that does happen more in, let me go back a little bit. That happens more in gay males than lesbians. Um, lesbians are much more likely to sort of uh, have bisexual tendencies than gay males. But they are somewhat stable. Gay identity and lesbian identity are somewhat stable. Heterosexual identity is the most stable of the sexual orientations. But uh, you are going to find a lot of people who are gay men who have stable identities as gay men. And a lot of lesbians who have stable identities as lesbians. For bisexual individuals, that happens a lot less. Yes, those people exist. People who sometime in adolescence or even in early adulthood come to the realization that they're bisexual and then 60 years later they go, I'm bisexual and I've always been bisexual and it is a stable identity. But with bisexual people, there is a lot more shit. That is, sometimes when a bisexual person is with, uh, let's say it's a bisexual woman, when she is with a man in a relationship, she goes, I'm straight. And when she is in a relationship with a woman, she goes, I'm a lesbian. And if the bisexual person is a man, when he's in a relationship with a woman, he says, I'm straight. And when he's in a relationship with another man, he'll say, I'm gay. And so these people don't necessarily always have a stable sexual identity. But of course, because we have a better understanding of this concept of bisexuality, now younger bisexual people tend to have a more stable bisexual identity. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait another five, ten years uh, before the data catches up to what's happening on the ground and then we can say, yeah, for sure this is happening. Right now, we can't really say that for sure. Now, some people are transgender. and Transgender people do tend to have a somewhat stable identity, but it depends on when the person realizes that they're transgender. And so usually if someone is going to transition into their psychological sex, we want them to have started realizing their psychological sex when they were around five or six years old. And so that happens right around five or six years old, a little kid starts saying, why do I have a penis? I'm supposed to be a girl. Or little girls might say, when am I gonna grow a penis? I'm supposed to be a boy. And when that starts early on, that person, when they transition into their psychological sex, uh, they tend to be happy that they have transitioned, they tend to have to be more functional, and they tend to be have a stable sort of transgender identity. Um, there's a problem with that because of course some families got really scared about that and mom and dad would say, no you're not, you're a boy, stop saying that you're a little girl. And so this kid 
won't say it. They might be afraid to say it. And so uh, we still want to know that that began in uh, childhood. And so psychologists will often uh, have uh, it be, sessions where they try to figure out when did the ideation uh, uh, that they were in the wrong body begin. Because, of course, some people live their entire life as cisgender. That is, they were born male, and they're 18, and they still think of themselves as male. And they had, you know, they were, they were in a little relationship when they were in middle school, and they thought of themselves as a cis male in a straight relationship, let's say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then something happens at around 19, let's say, uh, and they go through some traumatic event, and now they start to think that they might be transgender. If this person transitions, there is a chance that they will regret transitioning, and uh, they'll try to transition back, and obviously our technology uh, it's not good enough to do that, to transition into one gender and then transition back. We just don't have that ability at this point. And so usually psychologists will not sign off on this individual transitioning. Uh, these people are rare. It's They're much less likely uh, to be uh, this kind of individual. People who are transgender usually know since they're very young. And whether they were allowed to say it at home or not, they've always kind of felt that way. And sometimes they're not aware that they feel this way. Um, they might have feelings of like, I wish I were a woman, or I feel bad about being a man, or they might think like, I always just figured all men hated being men, they might say. Uh, and so basically what, what you're seeing there is that these people have always had these feelings because weren't necessarily aware they hadn't thought, oh, maybe what I want to do is transition, but those feelings did always exist. And so you have to uh, sort of uh, go through therapy and determine if this is something that has been happening since early on. And most people who are transgender will tell you, yeah, in reality, I have always known that I was in the wrong place. Now, um, Sexual identity itself is a label that you use. So you might say that you are straight or that you are gay or lesbian or that you're transgender. By the way, someone who's transgender might be gay or lesbian, but uh, uh, we don't often use those terms for this individual. So that if a person is transgender, a transgender woman who only dates women or a transgender woman who only dates men or back and forth, um, or with bisexual, uh, we just tend to sort of say that they're transgender, and we don't really ask, uh, kind of in polite society, what their sexual orientation is. Although, you know, if it's a close friend, uh, you might ask that. Uh, but usually that's just something that we, we don't go into, just sort of uh, not polite in our culture to ask something like that. Now, some people, especially in modern time, have... Uh, Sexual identities that are not always well studied. People who are asexual or demisexual or gender fluid or pansexual. These are all sexual identities that we know exist and that many people probably have. They're just not very well studied. And so a lot of the best data you're going to get is kind of from just the internet and, and people who talk about their own experiences, and hopefully within the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to get great data, but right now we don't have great data. Oh. Okay. Now, um, why are people gay or lesbian? Why are people transgender? Anyone who tells you that they know why someone is gay or lesbian or transgender is wrong. No one knows this. Are there biological aspects? Yes. Do we think that they might be genetic? There is some data that suggests there might be genetic components. Do we know that there's a, a gene? No. Is there a possibility that something to do with your brain, how your brain is developed? 
there is some data that suggests that men and women's brains are different and sometimes gay men's brains are a little bit more like female brains and sometimes lesbian brains are a little bit more like straight men. That does not always transfer to transgender people. But again, the data is just not very strong. We don't know for sure what is driving it. But we do know that there are both environmental and biological factors. Things like reinforcing sexual behaviors, uh, uh, so, you know, if you're already, if you're having sex with people of the same sex, that might reinforce that. Not always, right? Some people experiment in high school or college, and then they realize, oh, no, this isn't that for me. Um, childhood abuse is sometimes related to sexual activity in adult, uh, in adulthood. And so sometimes, uh, this happens more with women, women who have been abused sexually in uh, childhood will sometimes say that's why I'm a lesbian. Uh, but what we find uh, uh, is that some people are sexually abused and they're still straight. Uh, and they might be sexually abused by someone of the same sex or whatever, and they're still straight. And so uh, there isn't really a good uh, a good way to measure if this happens, this person will be gay or lesbian or straight. What we do see is that with identical twins, the chances if one person is gay that the other twin is also gay increases a great deal, but it's not a hundred percent, it's not even close to a hundred percent. And so, again, there, even though uh, there the it's increased in twins, the chances that they're both, they'll both be straight, they'll both be gay, or they'll both be lesbians, is increased um, uh, compared to brothers or sisters uh, or fraternal twins. It's still not 100%. And so we know that that cannot be the only factor. Um, and again, we go back to the uh, masculinization or feminization of the body and the brain. So that tends to happen during uh, pregnancy. Uh, during the first two months of pregnancy, the sex organ get uh, differentiated. Boys will develop penis and testes. Girls will develop vulvas and uh, uteruses and vaginas. Uh, uh, and then it happens the second time during pregnancy. And during that second time, instead of differentiating the genitals, the brain seems to be differentiated. And the brain will get masculinized or feminized. And then the question comes up, do we see that that is related to being gay or lesbian? Um, well, one of the things that we find is that people who are women that are lesbian there are certain ways that we can determine that they, in fact, were exposed to more testosterone when, when they were in uh, when they were in their mom's uterus. Uh, but again, that data is not super conclusive. Uh, they tend to be correlational studies, which is fine. It's, it's a great data, like oh, that's really interesting. But it doesn't necessarily tell us if this happens then for sure this woman will turn out to be a lesbian. And there isn't necessarily a corresponding version of that for, for men. Uh, one of the, the men things that happens in, uh, in pregnancy is that if you are a second born son, a third born son or greater, there is a greater chance that you may be gay. And the idea is that mom's body has gotten better at suppressing testosterone in her own body. And by suppressing the testosterone, maybe that feminizes the brain a little. But again, that is merely speculation at this point. If anyone tells you that they know why someone is gay or lesbian or transgender, that person does not know what they're talking about. There's a lot of data. 
but there is nothing conclusive at this point. For people who uh, uh, just basically identify as gay or lesbian, usually there are steps just like in identity, just like in ethnic identity or sexual identity. Uh, uh, people who are gay or lesbian uh, will also have an identity development. Usually they, do, they realize that they have an attraction for the same gender. Uh, sometimes they, depending on the family they live in, might welcome this and sometimes they will hide it. But soon after that, they start to realize, oh, the fact that I like the same gender means that I am gay or lesbian. And then they start internalizing that as a part of their identity. Soon after that, uh, they will likely find a way to engage in sex with people of the same gender. And often after that, after their sense of identity is well established within themselves, there is a desire to just sort of express it and say, I am gay or I am lesbian or I am a transgender person. Sometimes these uh, steps are you know, mixed up uh, so that maybe someone finds, uh, someone will have sex with someone of the same gender first, and then they'll realize, oh yeah, this is what I, uh, what I like. Um, uh, and of course, not everybody uh, goes through this during a specific time in their life. Some people realize this really early on, by the time they're in elementary school or middle school, they kind of understand that they uh, have a same-sex attraction. And some people don't. Some people are in their 30s and 40s, and sometimes even older, before they come to the realization. And uh, again, that uh, might be part of that idea of diffusion or foreclosure or moratorium. Uh, that might be affecting uh, sexual orientation, identity development. Uh, but usually most people who are gay or lesbian go through these stages. Uh, shift very uh, hard here and talk about juvenile delinquency briefly. Uh, uh, obviously, juvenile delinquency is when uh, adolescents usually or children uh, commit illegal activities. Some of these are serious behaviors like homicide or rape or robbery, and some of them are less serious, like things like truancy underage drinking, running away from home, uh, or sexual promiscuity. Um, uh, it tends to be the case that boys are much more likely to engage in serious uh, behaviors uh, of uh, juvenile delinquency, and girls are much more likely to engage in the less serious ones, especially truancy, uh, underage drinking or running away from home or sexual promiscuity, uh, girls are much more likely to engage in those than boys. Uh, because boys are more aggressive, because boys are much more likely to engage in things like gang membership or fights, uh, things like that, they, the chances that boys' delinquent behavior will be more serious um, uh, are both biological and in part sociocultural boys are allowed to be more aggressive than girls are, and sometimes that does lead to that. Uh, when adolescents are arrested, especially in our culture, uh, in our country, there's usually ways to try to avoid uh, having to go through the system, especially if, the, if it's the first offense, or if it's an issue that came out of nowhere where kids are getting in trouble a lot now, but they do think never got in trouble before. A lot of times you can work with the courts or police office, uh, officers to make sure the kid doesn't go through the system. But of course, some kids do go through that system, and that system is not good. Our, uh, uh, it should be jail and prison system, even for adolescents, is not really. Uh, is not really helpful for adolescents and in fact makes them more likely to be violent and makes them more likely to 
uh, increase their delinquent behavior. All right, talk very quickly about suicide. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death among adolescents. And obviously this is, lead, this is uh, related to feelings of depression and hopelessness. When an adolescent or an adult feels like they have no control over their life, uh, they often fall into depression. In an adolescence, there is a good chance that you're going to feel this way because you don't have a lot of things you control. Parents control most of your life. Teachers control a lot of your life. And the thing that you do control is like friendships, how well you do with class, uh, maybe when you hang out every once in a while. And if your life starts to fall into a spiral, maybe mom and dad get divorced, someone in your family uh, dies or gets sick, you stop doing well at school, maybe you have to get into fights with your friends, all of a sudden, everything else can start to feel like it's spiraling, like you don't have control of your life. So that can definitely lead to feelings of depression, which then might lead to feelings of suicide. Um, there are certain uh, signs of suicide. Uh, first of all, if people believe that suicide is acceptable. Some people are like, no, suicide is never acceptable. And some people have a sense of like, yeah, it's there's nothing wrong with that, or it's like a completely uh, acceptable uh, alternative. And that by itself doesn't mean this person is thinking about suicide, but it's definitely a warning sign. Drug abuse and other kinds of delinquency might be related to depression in adolescence, and so that might be a sign of suicide. <laughs> Bullying, especially when the child feels like you know, the bully leads to feelings of, of depression, of feeling like nobody likes me. Uh, excessive body piercing. Now, it's not the piercings that make the, excuse me, that make the person want to commit suicide, but the uh, piercings, what is excessive, what it seems to be like all the time, this could be someone trying to kind of fill a void. And it's not just piercing, it could be other things that uh, you know, the person is trying to fill a void with. Uh, and by itself, it may not mean anything alone. But once you start getting a few of these together, that could be a problem. Stress, hostility, depression, other psychological disorders. Heavy smoking, uh, again, goes back to that excessive, excessive piercing. It's just a sign that the person might be trying to fill a hole. Low self-esteem. One of the classic warning signs is when someone gives away things that they value a lot. Maybe this person values their record collection a great deal. And all of a sudden, they're giving it away. And they might say things like, I'm not going to have any need for it anymore. That is a warning sign. And so when you get a lot of these together, uh, that is usually a good time to ask, hey, have you been thinking about suicide? Sometimes we're afraid to ask because we think that we're going to put the idea in the person's head. But the truth is that these people are probably already thinking about it. So it's just better to ask. And if you don't, if you're just a teenager, if you're just someone who doesn't have a way to help this person out, if you're a friend out, then this is the time to get help. Call a parent, a teacher, a counselor, someone who might be able to get the ball rolling. Very briefly, uh, Native American and Latin American uh, teenagers have the highest rates of suicide. Also, uh, the uh, gay, lesbian, and transgender people have a very high incidence of suicide. Uh, that is, uh, it is be one of the highest statistics. And uh, women, females, are much more likely to attempt suicide. But men are much more likely to complete a suicide. Why? Women are much more likely to do things like, uh, excuse me, take drugs, 
or slice their wrists or uh, tell someone that they might be thinking about suicide. Men are much more likely to not tell anyone and to do things that can't be stopped, right? If someone catches you right after you have uh, taken pills or if someone catches you right after you uh, cut your wrist, there is a chance that someone might be able to help you out. Not always, but there is a chance. Whereas men are much more likely to not tell anyone and then try to hang themselves or maybe use a gun. And that is, it's way harder to help someone after that. And so uh, uh, it, it is more likely that men complete suicide. But whether someone just tells you or you picked up on warning signs, you definitely want to start telling someone so that you can get help from that individual. Okay. Guys, at this point, uh, this is the end of chapter 12. Uh, there are activities for chapters 11 and 12 on the uh, money tab, and you should be uh, working on your project. If you have any questions, please email me, and I'll try to get uh, that to you as soon as possible.